Committee on Military Veterans Affairs and Homeland Security will come to order and will stand at ease at the call of the chair. The committee will come back to order and the clerk will call the roll for the purposes of taking attendance. Chair LaFave. Here. Marino. Affandoulis. Here. Markina. Here. Jones. Present. Cherkin. Here. Carter. Present. Manugian. Here. Mr. Chair, you have eight members of President Quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Representative Jones moves to approve the minutes of October 8th meeting. Are there any objections? Without objections, the meeting minutes are approved. Today we're going to take up and hear testimony on House Bill 4770, 4771, 72, 73, and 74. At this time, I would ask that the bill sponsors come forward, play nice with one, each, with one another, and um, hopefully uh, you guys can figure out a way to work together on this one and, and testify. Well, not all the bill sponsors are here yet. They might be trickling in as we get started. First off, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chairs of the Committee, esteemed members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today in favor of this important piece of legislation, oftentimes referred to as constitutional carry. Now, our founders rightly understood that we have certain God-given rights, and they wrote the Constitution in a way to ensure that our government was restricted from infringing upon those rights. Look at the U.S. Constitution, Second Amendment, right to bear arms shall not be infringed. However, you look at the Michigan Constitution, it goes beyond that. Article 1, Section 6, every person has the right to keep and bear arms for the, for his self, uh, for the defense of himself and for the state, even stronger than the Second Amendment. But here in Michigan, if you want to carry a firearm for your self-defense and you want to conceal that because you don't want people to know that you're packing heat, these aren't good enough. Instead you got to pay $115 to get this special card. Now let me be clear about what this bill does not do. This does not increase access to firearms. This does not change who can purchase a firearm. This does not change who can own a firearm. What this has to deal with is how you can carry a firearm. Current law in Michigan, you can open carry, right? I can be in this room, I can have a pistol on my hip for everyone to see. As long as I'm legally allowed to possess a firearm, to own a firearm, I can do that. But the second I put a code on, I cover it, now I've committed a five-year felony unless I have this special card. $115 may not seem like a lot of money to you guys. We have pretty good jobs. But to some people, that's a lot of money. That prohibits some from buying or for paying for their next rent payment. Prohibits some from buying food. That's a real cost to a lot of people. Now, we do live in an age of divided government. Republicans and Democrats, we have to work together to get stuff done. We haven't always been the best at it. There's been one area where we've been pretty good, criminal justice reform. Earlier this session, we did civil asset forfeiture. This week, we're doing raise the age. We'll probably do expungement in the future. But I would submit to the committee that we cannot have a true discussion on criminal justice reform if we don't talk about Michigan firearm laws. It is very easy for a a rather good person in Michigan to get caught up with these laws and get a felony. I'm not talking about someone who brandishes a weapon or threatens someone or uses it, just someone who has a gun on their hip and puts a coat on unknowingly. Someone who hops in their car, doesn't take their gun apart as they're supposed to. That's a felony for other good people. And because of that, they can lose their job, their life can be destroyed. This is about people who are allowed to carry they are legally allowed to own the gun. They are legally allowed to carry the gun. This is just about how they carry it. I would imagine that if you are in favor of people concealing their weapon, if you don't want them to have their weapon out in plain sight, you should favor this bill because current law actually incentivizes open carry. So if you would prefer people conceal carry, this legislation does that. So I'd ask that the committee members uh, think uh, long and hard about this bill. This is about protecting good, law-abiding Michiganders. This is nothing new. Other states have done it. Vermont's done it. Bernie Sandersville, right, very liberal state. They have constitutional carry. And they are not a highly violent state. 
This is a good piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm among five members here testifying, actually four, but there's five uh, bills, in support of right to carry or constitutional carry legislation. So I won't restate all the arguments my colleagues are making. You have my written testimony, which goes over these arguments in my own words. However, since it is my bill that removes the prohibition on so-called gun-free zones, I'll address this issue in particular. Criminalizing the possession of firearms is in any location affects only the good guys, not the bad guys. Criminals don't obey laws, and obviously anybody using a gun to commit a crime is already committing a much more serious crime than just violating the gun-free zone. What we're really doing when we declare a place to be a gun-free zone is informing would-be criminals that this location is where you can safely assume their victims will be defenseless. That's why 94% of mass shootings occur at these locations. There's a good reason we have armed security here at the Capitol, and I don't think anybody here would consider it a good idea if, if we did not have armed security. Well, many places don't have the ability to have professional armed security at all times. The only deterrent is the fact that criminals can't safely assume their victims will be defenseless. Most of the places where caring is now essentially prohibited are private property. Churches, hospitals, taverns, theaters, these places should be these places should be free to decide their own policy. Some of the provisions in current law are inconsistent. For example, only bars that don't serve food are so-called gun-free zones. Whether or not you serve food shouldn't be a determining question. And of course, no matter what, carry, what carrying a firearm when you have any alcohol in your system is totally illegal. As to the so-called gun-free zones on public property, I note that the overwhelming majority of public property is not a gun-free zone. So why should a daycare center be any different? We don't have violent crimes at daycare centers, and if the concern is mass shooters, the, me the better message to send is that they can't count on people to be defenseless. <clears throat> the bottom line is guns stop crime, and gun rights discourage crime. The appropriate policy is to allow property owners to determine the policy for their own property, and in public, People should be able to defend themselves. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer, uh, take any questions or continue to the next presenter. There is an important hearing. I do have a Natural Resources Committee, so after taking questions, I need to excuse myself, but I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'd be happy to respond to anything uh, by, uh, in writing. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My bill simply states the DNR does not prohibit an individual from transporting a pistol concealed or not. And then I'd like to speak um, with your permission on behalf of the, the package. Um, I have a, a CPL, and that's a license to carry. I am always carrying. I don't go anywhere without my uh, firearm with me. But nobody usually knows I'm carrying, because 99% of the time um, people don't look. It's a slight bulge either in my waist or on my ankle, and nobody knows it's there. And that's how most people who carry with CPLs, that's how we usually operate. You would know I was carrying if someone came to do us harm. If somebody came into the room and tried to do any of you here harm or tried to do harm to my family or harm to me, you would know I was carrying because I would protect any of us that I could within my power. Laws that prohibit me from protecting myself and my family fly in the face of the cons our constitutional rights. To force a law-abiding citizen to leave my firearm in my car just to enter a building that prohibits firearms does not keep anyone safe. I just want to tell you a story very quickly. I live here in Lansing um, a few days of the night of the week because I travel. Um, my district is so far away. And I'll say I, I live on Walnut Street. And there was a shooting. Somebody sent me a, uh, it was late at night, somebody sent me a text and the headline was, uh, to, to, be, to be exact, the headline read, shootout between two and one dead. This happened in my parking lot at my building here where I stay. I wasn't here. But I can only imagine that if I would have been here when that was happening, when I get down here late at night 
I'm hauling my clothes out of my car into my apartment. When I read that he headline, it was actually a lobbyist that sent me the, the article, I was like, wow, if I would have been out in my car carrying my clothes to my apartment and I wouldn't have been allowed to have my firearm on me because it was a, a gun-free zone, how vulnerable I would have felt, how unsafe I would have felt at that time. I've never been in that position, thank God, but I cannot imagine being so vulnerable and having a state tell me I cannot carry into certain places where people are so vulnerable. So I just ask you to, um, to consider this package of bills. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try and be as loud as possible because I'm sure the mic won't pick me up. Um, I am the sponsor of HB uh, 4774, which um, is just a basic um, cleanup for a reference section um, in the corrections code. It amends the corrections code of 1953 to remove references to a section of law repealed in um, HB 4770. And I'll just add that I, like Representative Hoytinga, carry every day. I'm always carrying because I feel that um, as a woman, I need to be able to protect myself and my daughter, no matter where we are. Um, so, and you would not know that I'm carrying unless, as Representative Hoytinga said, there was some reason for me to protect myself, my daughter, or others in any situation. Um, I'm also a former teacher. I taught for 23 years, and um, I am 100%, you know, pro people being able to protect themselves and pro Second Amendment. So, thank you. And Representative Maddock could not be here. He's on the package. He's in an approach committee. His bill just deals with the sentencing guidelines, updating that to reflect the changes in our bills. Updating to reflect criminal justice reform? Yes. Okay. Are there any questions of committee members for the bill sponsors? There are plenty of other folks wishing to testify. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, colleagues. Just so everybody's clear, we just want to make sure this does not, this would just make sure that if an individual business wanted to have a gun-free zone, that's, that's their right, correct? This does not affect private property rights. They still have the ability to regulate their own private property any way they want. So you look at the, the pistol-free zone that we amended, most of those places are private places, you know, churches. They can still regulate however they feel is best for their situation. Okay, I just want to make sure that yep. so the state's not telling people that they have to be a gun-free zone, if, but they can if they want. Correct. Okay. And I do believe this bill is excluded schools. Right. right, this does not affect schools. And I will also point out that on those lists right now, the so-called pistol-free zone, if you have your CPL, you can carry there if you, if you open carry. So this isn't allowing people to carry in a spot that they, you know, before couldn't. This is just allowing them to actually conceal carry where they couldn't in the past. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure that was clear for everybody. Representative Carter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, how do I, I frame this? You know, the responsibility of carrying a firearm, I listened to you to say that, you know, you would protect people. Um, that's a huge responsibility. And under these bills, would someone be responsible for taking a gun safety course? Is there minimum requirements for going to the range or what, what are the requirements or just wide open? It's the same requirements that it's under current law for people to open carry. Right? You can open carry right now without having to take a class, you have to spend money without having to go to the range. Obviously we want to encourage people to get training and what we've seen in other states that have done this is that after the law passed there's actually a slight decrease in training immediately but then after that they saw training go up in the long run because we still keep the CPL process in place for reciprocity's sake for other states. And so actually what we've seen is an increase in training in the long run. But once again, this would get rid of that requirement and put the same as open carry. So just as I can open carry in all these places right now without a permit, this would allow you to conceal carry in those same places with the same amount of training. Okay, the, the other question I have, uh, you all have stated all of these situations and instances that I'm keenly aware of. The question I have is, what is the liability factor for someone who thinks they're going to protect somebody and end up shooting somebody, an innocent bystander? Yeah, and these bills don't change that. So I, I don't know the exact, I mean, I'd have to refer to our legal counsel on that, but I would point out these don't change any of that. These does not, this doesn't affect who can carry, and if you are already legally allowed to carry, this just changes you can go from open to concealed carry without a permit. I have many other questions, but 
we'll, we'll, we'll get to those later. Thank you. Representative Churkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Morning. Representatives, um, I have one question. Uh, can you run by what you said about open carry again? If a person open carries, they, doesn't, they don't have to have training? Right. Current state of Michigan, if you're 18 years old, you can go, you can purchase a firearm, and you can open carry in a public place. So I could go get an AR-15, sling it on my back, and I could show up to this committee room without any training, without any permit, without any license. Okay. Happened that is current law today. All right. Um, so the people that, I, I guess you, what I'm trying to say is, you, you're, are you cutting out all training for everybody? No. Okay, just everybody that can constitutional carry has to still go through a class. Is that what you're no, saying? You are, you're not required to go through training. To Just same as open carry, you don't have to go through training. For concealed carry, we're saying you don't have to go through training either. However, we still keep the CPL process in place. So if you wish to go through training, to get the license because the CPL is valuable to have if you want to go to other states and carry. Uh, a lot of states have reciprocity. So you still keep that mechanism there. And most people still want to get training. Training is a good thing to get. But this would eliminate that requirement, the same as you have with open carry currently. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relate a, a quick story to you guys because I, I don't know what kind of guns you carry, if they're automatics or revolvers and that, and what kind of nomenclature they are. But I was involved in a case one time where uh, a bad guy robbed a couple. Well, they didn't know that the couple owned a gun store. Just to make a long story short, the owner, the, the, the husband, he shot two out of the three of them. And uh, it come to find out from the evidence tech that the guy never chambered a bullet in his automatic. So he went to pull the trigger and nothing happened. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, if everybody in the state of Michigan wants to carry a gun, they got to at least know where to put the bullet at. You understand what I'm saying? You would hope they would know how to do that. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I think that there should be no question. They ought to know which end that they point the gun at. Thank you. That's all I have. I have a series of questions for Representative Johnson. Um, we have a right in this state, a guaranteed right to vote, right? Correct. And how much is the permit fee for voting in the state of Michigan? It'd be illegal to have a fee. It's illegal to have a fee for voting. Yes. Um, obviously, there's a lot of choices involved when you go out to vote. What's our educational requirement for voting? It's zero, and it shows sometimes. So we have absolutely That's a no. Joke, by the way, we have absolutely no voting requirements for permit fees or education. Correct. But with regard to the Second Amendment, you think you want to put that in parity with our rights uh, to vote? Get rid of the $115 fee that many people just can't afford. Representative Representative Jones and then Representative Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Kyle Lee, thanks for being here this morning. I think uh, just to piggyback on what our um, chairman was talking about, I know we have state IDs and driver's licenses here in the state as well. You know, I'm 24 and a half years old, so um, I've been around for a little while now. Um, I wasn't here when the state was uh, first, you know, started, so I didn't, you know, come with the idea to have driver's licenses. Um, but I think a lot of people across the state um, get driver's license suspended it um, and fall into this cycle of. Um, not being able to pay, and then they, you know, since we're talking about criminal justice, they fall inside of this vicious uh, cycle um, in our criminal justice system or in our corrections system. Um, so I think maybe, I mean, we're talking about uh, eliminating the CPL um, or not requiring it to be had. Maybe we just should allow people to drive around the state of Michigan uh, without a driver license as well. Um, you know, since it's a financial hindrance um, to some folk, just a suggestion, though. Well, I would suggests that driving is not a right. I mean, that's a privilege where the right to bear arms is a constitutional right in the U.S. Constitution and the Michigan Constitution. So there is a pretty big difference between the two. And I, I would support legislation decreasing the cost of driver's licenses. Be happy to work with you on that. Yeah, if you wanted to tie bar that legislation to this one, I'd be happy to move it out at the same time. <laughs> Get rid of those fees as well. well. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Just a follow up too, just so people are clear, this doesn't um, and <clears throat> doesn't take away any background checks, so people still have to get the background checks to to get their get their handguns and so they can't have convictions for domestic violence. They can't be a felon, they can't have a PPO. There's it has no inf nothing to, those two are not 
Correct. Even the close purchasing together. of a firearm is not affected at all. The purchasing or owning of a firearm is not affected at all in this legislation. Okay. Thank you. Bill sponsors, I want to thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Steve from the Michigan Coalition for Responsible Gun Owners. Supports the bill, wishes to testify. Jones did have a follow up, I guess. Oh. I'm sorry, Representative. Hey, uh, bill sponsors, we have, a, we have a quick question from Representative Jones. Which member specifically? Uh, it, it, it could be to any of them. I just had a, got a note here from, uh, from Michigan Health and Hospital Association. I know it's mentioning uh, the hospitals being, I don't, I'm not sure, they, you know, they're gun-free zones, and they have some concerns. So I'm just trying to see. Uh, yeah, be happy to address that. So hospitals, if, number one, if they're a private hospital, they can regulate however they see fit. So like your Henry Ford system, they can continue to do that. As far as a public hospital, current law, you can open carry there if you have your CPL. So once again, this isn't allowing people to carry in a spot they weren't allowed to previously, just that they were only allowed to open carry. Now, the hospital could allow them to conceal carry. And I would argue, in my opinion, I think a lot of times people prefer that you conceal carry instead of open carry. And right. Representative Jones, they do have a card in. Um, they said they did not wish to speak, but if they would like to speak at any time, we'd be happy to have them on. And through the chair, since you mentioned they can open carry in these public uh, hospitals with the CPL, um, so would that require under this, this, this new law, let's say, entertain the idea that it passes, um, that they would only be able to conceal carry if they have a CPL? They could be trespassed at any time Okay. under current law and if this bill were to pass. Correct. It just wouldn't be the government saying that you must not carry there. Currently, the government does not allow you to conceal carry at a hospital, public or private. This would allow that, if they allowed it. Thank you very much, Representative Johnson. Thanks. The other Steve, this one from Michigan Coalition for Responsible Gun Owners. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Steve Doolin. I am a uh, member of the Board of Directors of the Michigan Coalition for Responsible Gun Owners. Uh, I am also an adjunct professor at Cooley Law School, and one of the courses I teach is called Gun Control Seminar. It's essentially firearms law. Taught that class for about 15 years. Uh, I've heard um, uh, some, and I'm also an attorney in private practice in East Lansing, and I think that's going to be relevant here in a second. But uh, I've, I've heard some good facts and logic so far. I've heard that there's been written testimony. So I think a lot of what I was planning to say is, has already uh, been brought up and you've been made aware of it. Uh, the fact that 94% uh, of all multiple victim public killings have occurred in so-called gun-free zones since World War II uh, was something I was definitely going to mention. Uh, and I want to reiterate that for a moment. Uh, one of the things I do is teach the legal portion of the concealed pistol license class. It's a two-hour block of Michigan law. And when I put that list of so-called pistol-free zones up on the uh, projector, I say these are the mass murderer empowerment zones. And in fact, it's the psychopath shopping list. When you look at the list of places that's printed on the back of the Michigan concealed pistol license, where we are not allowed to carry concealed, those are the places, and you'll recognize it right away if you've never seen the list. Ask somebody to show you their license. Uh, those are the places that these multiple victim public killings occur. But that's not a huge threat statistically, right? You're more likely to be struck by lightning than to be a victim of a multiple victim public killing, actually. But that tends to be something people worry about, so we mention it. In fact, all we're asking in terms of supporting these bills is to be put on a level playing ground with the criminals. The bad guys don't show up for class. They don't bother getting licenses. Uh, they just put the guns in their pockets and go do what they do. Uh, in fact, I was changing as I was driving over here. I was changing what I was going to say to you all because I had a conversation about an hour and a half ago with a gentleman who has two felony convictions. And he was asking me about how can he get his gun rights back. Well, it's nearly impossible if you have two felony convictions because you can only expunge one. Uh, so I told him we have a serious problem here. You can try to get a pardon from a governor or a president, but good luck. You know, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, but he said, as we ended the conversation and I was getting ready to come over here, he said, well, what do I do with the guns I already have? Right? So the, the current law doesn't stop people with ill intent or people who are simply disqualified from getting and carrying guns. This guy had a gun in his pocket while he was talking to me. He is a prohibited person. He's not allowed to carry guns. He's not allowed to own guns. Nothing we do here 
or nothing you all do, more specifically, can stop that, right? Uh, in fact, the way he phrased it, he goes, too easy. It's too easy, right? He can get a gun anywhere. We've got, no one even knows how many guns are in private hands in the U.S., and I think that's a good thing, but it's somewhere between four and 500 million guns in private hands. Uh, and it's real easy to make guns. A three-quarter inch pipe from the hardware store is a 12 gauge, in case you didn't know that one. Uh, super easy to make guns if you can't find one to buy. So what's happening here is, as we're discussing, we're just talking about putting law-abiding citizens on a level playing ground. That's it. Uh, the bad guys are already doing whatever they do all day, every day. You're surrounded by guns everywhere you go. Uh, you don't realize it necessarily because most of us who have concealed licenses carry concealed. Uh, we can talk about rights and the Constitution, and I think other folks are going to do that and reiterate. But I just want you to think practically for a moment. The current law only affects law-abiding citizens who are deprived of the right to self-defense. That's all the law does that's currently in place. That's all it's ever done. Any questions? Representative Carter. Yeah, thank you, Chair. You said that it deprives law-abiding citizens right now. What's to stop them from going to take a CPL class, be compliant? And there are a lot of pistol-free zones. I know some private places that will not allow anyone. Medical marijuana, well, recreational is now a big deal. Post offices, other places. There always are going to be places that nobody, I understand as a former retired officer, law-abiding people abide the laws. Criminals don't care. Do we really want to put ourselves in a situation that we're criminals as well? Because if you got it, you pull it out, you're going to use it. Then we got to see you. So law-abiding folks need to cover themselves with some type of training. Fair enough. My, my dispute would be with mandatory training, uh, and here's why. Uh, you, there was a time in Michigan before we had a preemption statute when local units of government could make their own gun laws. Uh, I lived in East Lansing at the time, as I do now. I live outside the, ci the city now, but I was in the city limits of East Lansing. So in order to get a pistol purchase permit, I would have to go take a class, a safety class, three-hour-long safety class City of East Lansing was offering. Seemed reasonable at the time, but then I found out that the trick they were playing is they simply never offered the class. Right? So that was their way of having a de facto ban on purchase permits in the city of East Lansing. They gave lip service to the idea of training and simply never offered it. That's the kind of thing that happens with mandatory training in my experience. Uh, as you've heard previously, the states, by the way, we've got over a dozen states that are, have done the experiment for us in constitutional carry. Uh, they are uh, actually experiencing higher training rates and lower crime rates. Uh, in fact, I think Maine is the safest state in the union as of the latest year we have data for, and they went constitutional carry a few years ago. Uh, and, and, and don't hold my feet to the fire, I get the M states other than Michigan confused sometimes, right? It might be one of the other ones. Uh, but the data is very clear when you look at it. Uh, constitutional carry leads to increased training after the first year, essentially. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm all in favor of training. It's mandatory training that, that I would object to. Yes, Representative. And, and I appreciate your answer, and I'll say this. As an officer, and I'm thinking about current officers, you come into a place where there's a situation and everybody's got a gun. How do you sort it out? That, that is the biggest fear that I have. And because we train to not be in crossfire of friendly fire. You walk into a place where everybody's pulling it out with no training, none, and all of a sudden everybody's Rambo. That is a scary thought for me. I, I, I don't blame you a bit, Representative, and if I could respond briefly, um, you know, I, I've uh, got cops that I love, so I understand uh, the situation. Uh, and I'll say this, what we, what we do train now in our CPL classes, or at least most of us do, is law enforcement arrives, drop your gun. That's step one. Right? Don't, have, don't greet law enforcement with gun in hand, is how I always state it. Um, but we haven't seen a ton of this. It's a fear, but we haven't seen a ton of it. And we've got over 650,000 concealed pistol licensees in Michigan right now, uh, not counting the open carriers who don't have CPLs and not counting the criminals who are disobeying the law and carrying guns anyway. So we actually haven't seen that situation very often. I understand it's very frightening for law enforcement. I get that. It, it just doesn't happen that often, uh, and um, there's nothing to stop somebody from defending themselves when they were carrying unlawfully. I know this happens, too. I told you about the felon I talked to this morning, but I also know that some people who have CPLs choose to carry in these places, in these gun-free zones. Uh, and w they've been doing that for, since we had the licensing in place almost 20 years now, and we just haven't seen that situation happen very often, thankfully. Thankfully. 
I appreciate everything you said. And I wish I lived where some of you live so we can have an equality conversation. But I live in the real world where this doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the committee for having the courage to take this up. Uh, Ms. Finn of Moms Demand Action. I'm sorry, could you state your name for the record for us? It's Carmi Finn. Thank you for giving me the time to speak today. As we said, my name is Carmi Finn. I'm from Warren, and I'm a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Um, I'm glad to be here today to discuss this dangerous piece of legislation. House Bill 4770 through 4774 would put children and families at risk by allowing people to carry hidden, loaded handguns in public without a permit or safety training. Eliminating Michigan's concealed carry permit requirement would lower the bar for who may carry handguns in public in Michigan and would make it easy for dangerous individuals to carry loaded handguns in crowded town centers and on city streets. Lawmakers should put the safety of their constituents first and reject House Bill 4770. The current permitting system in Michigan contains safeguards of a criminal background check and a safety training course, which makes it so not just anyone can carry handguns in our communities. I consider the current required training for a concealed handgun permit a minimum. Those who carry loaded handguns in public need to continually practice their skills and train but our current permit system makes sure that those who want to carry at least learn the law and have shown that they can shoot a gun. If the Michigan legislature takes away these safeguards, it will put our community members at risk. After permitless carry was enacted in Missouri, St. Louis experienced a 25% increase in aggravated assaults with a gun in 2017 compared to 2016. Since Arizona enacted permitless carry in 2010, the rate of aggravated assaults committed with a firearm increased by 39% by 2017. We don't want these same results here in Michigan. Following the, the mass shootings in Dayton, Ohio and El Paso, Texas, our legislators should be focusing on policies that will protect Michiganders from further gun violence, not put them in more danger. House Bill 4770 takes Michigan in the wrong direction. I urge this committee to vote no on these bills. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Are there any questions? None at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, I'd invite Tom Lambert of the Michigan Open Carry to come testify. Uh, I believe he supports the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak. Committee members, my name is Tom Lambert. I'm the President and Legislative Director of Michigan Open Carry. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are well known throughout Lansing as knowing Michigan gun law very, very well. We get into the nitty gritty, minute details. I love this stuff. If you have any questions, regardless of your stance on this bill, please, please reach out to us and I would love to get you an answer. Whether it satisfies what you're looking for or not, I can't guarantee that, but I would absolutely love to get you an answer if you have any questions. Michigan Open Carry strongly supports this legislation. Now some of you might be asking, what is an open carry group doing here supporting constitutional concealed carry? That's a great question. First, Michigan Open Carry believes that it should be up to the individual to decide how they carry in their specific circumstances. It's not up to us and it shouldn't be up to the government. Every individual is different, every circumstance is different. People should be allowed to make their own decisions. Next and most importantly, Michigan has a very gray line when it comes to what is concealed carry. For those history buffs out there, Michigan first banned concealed pistols back in 1887. Like a lot of states in the post-Civil War Reformation era, era, Michigan started regulating concealed pistols for freed slaves that came about. In 1911, we started allowing permits. 1927, we came up with a law we currently have today. It's been tweaked ever since then. But despite having a law in regards to concealed pistols for well over 100 years, I can't tell you exactly what a concealed pistol is. 
Is something inside your waistband concealed? Maybe, maybe not. Courts in Michigan have traditionally held it as a fact-based question, which means it goes to a jury. And so now it's up to a jury to decide, was this particular firearm in this particular circumstance concealed? If they say no, congratulations, you are law-abiding. If they say it was concealed, congratulations, you are now, now guilty of a felony punishable by up to five years in prison. You lose your right to possess any firearms as well as a lot of other rights. That drop-off based on such an unclear line is amazing. When you look throughout other states in the country, most states do one of two things. Either they have a really strict punishment and a really narrow net, meaning we're only gonna apply our strict punishment to loaded pistols on the person. Or they have a lesser punishment if they have a wider net. Okay, it doesn't have to be loaded, or maybe it's near you, it doesn't have to be in your person, but it's only going to be a misdemeanor. I'm sure all of you would be very surprised to hear a president of a Michigan gun organization tell you, I wish we could be a little bit more like California. You see it's gotten a little bit of attention there. California does something a little bit more like this. Their net is different and their punishment is different. Michigan, we have both. We have a very wide net. Any pistol, whether it's loaded or not, it doesn't have to be on your person, it could just be anywhere in your vehicle, falls under this statute. And in, in addition to that, we have one of the most severe penalties in the nation. Here's a real world scenario. Just a couple years ago, guy gets out of the army, moves his family back to Detroit. He has a scholarship to go to medical school. When moving back to Michigan, he takes his pistol that he lawfully owned and possessed in the state that he came from. He didn't have the box for it anymore. So what he did is he took the slide off the pistol, shoved both the slide and the frame separately underneath the back seat of his SUV with all the other belongings that his family had in that SUV. Something happened in the area completely unrelated to them. The police asked to search the car. The wife consented to the search. The police found the separated firearm under the back seat of the SUV. No ammunition in the vehicle whatsoever. Because that pistol was not in a case designed for the storage of firearms, he was charged with CCW, the five-year felony, of which he was convicted, losing his scholarships to medical school. I want you to understand that's how draconian some of this stuff is. Those transport procedures, how do you transport a pistol lawfully in Michigan? That's not a simple task. In fact, Mr. Chair, with your permission, it's a task that I would like to demonstrate for the committee. With, you have permission. I have a, a pistol in, in a box for it with me here. And to be clear, this box has been checked by a member of security. There is no live ammunition in this box at all. Sergeants, is that correct? Thank you very much, Sergeants. There, you'll see two dummy rounds. They're completely inert. All they're there is for demonstration purposes. As I said, the requirements are, if you do not have a CPL, it must be unloaded, in a case designed for the storage of firearms, and in the trunk of your vehicle. And only if your vehicle does not have a trunk, then you have the option of putting the, the, the case in the passenger compartment of the vehicle, but then it must be not readily accessible to the occupants of the vehicle. So if I want to go somewhere, I have to take my case, put it in the trunk of my vehicle, go to where I'm going. Let's say I'm going to go out to uh, a park somewhere with my family. Drive to the park. I get out of my vehicle. I have to take my case out of the trunk. I cannot do this in the trunk. I then have to open the case with the pistol in there, take the pistol out, take the magazine that has ammunition in it, load it up chamber around because as uh, Representative Carter demonstrated or mentioned earlier, a pistol without a round in the chamber is think, frankly just a paperweight. Put it in my holster, throw the case back in the trunk and walk away. And then when I come back to my vehicle, I have to open the trunk, take the case out of the trunk. Again, I wanna stress that you can't do this inside of your vehicle. That's a felony. Take the firearm out of my holster, a loaded chambered firearm at this point, Take the safety off so that I can remove the magazine. Take my round out of the chamber. Probably gonna put my loose round back in the magazine where it came from. Put the firearm back in the case. Case it up, put it back in the trunk and go. Now the reason I demonstrate that for you is if you're standing there watching somebody that pulls up to a park, take a firearm out of a vehicle and start loading it up, 
if you don't know what you're witnessing, I can understand how you don't know what you, or you would understand what you just witnessed. You don't understand that you just witnessed somebody who's very law-abiding that is jumping through numerous hoops to make sure that they stay within the law as opposed to somebody who has bad intent. Now, I also want to make it very clear that just because somebody decides to open carry, that does not mean that they, have a, they, that they don't have a CPL. I have a CPL. I open carry frequently. Michigan Open Carry, as a general recommendation, recommends people do get their CPL because of all of this stuff that I just demonstrated to you. If you have your CPL, rather than go through all this stuff uh, that, uh, let me backtrack a little bit and, and talk about negligent discharges when uh, you fire your firearm accidentally. Whether you're a citizen, whether you're police, whether you're military, the number one time accidental discharges occur is when you handle your firearm, when you take it out of the holster. The holster I have on for you, or I have on today, allows me to take the entire holster off my body without taking the gun out. That's not an option if I don't have a CPL. As you saw, I have to physically unload that firearm. I have to take the firearm out, and I have to manipulate it to get that round out of the chamber. Regardless of what segment of society you fall in, that is the number one time when accidental discharges take place. But if you have your CPL, you get in your vehicle, you go. You get your place where you want to go, you get out of your vehicle, you're done. And Tom, for a question, why can't open carry individuals that have CPL have a weapon openly holstered on their hip with no coat on? Uh, sorry, if you mind restating that one more time. So I leave my house, I'm allowed to, without a CPL, you can open carry or, or conceal carry in your home. Yes, sir. You can walk through your driveway, yep. get into your car. Why can't I get in the car with a holstered open carry pistol without a CPL? Got it. Thank you, Representative. Uh, the statute applies to a person carrying a concealed pistol on their person or in a vehicle concealed or otherwise. So regardless of whether or not your pistol is concealed or open in your vehicle, you need the CPL to possess that pistol in the vehicle. Not all states do it that way. Michigan does. And again, even if it's not on your person, even if it's in the glove box, even if it's not loaded, it's still the full five-year felony. I want to reiterate a couple things. Michigan sorry, has... Tom. Hey, Tom, we are running out of time. If you could be quick. Can I have three seconds? Michigan has universal background checks when it comes to a purchasing a pistol in Michigan. You cannot lawfully purchase a pistol in Michigan without going through a background check. The fees associated with getting the Michigan CPL, we've done a lot of research into that. It's a $100 fee with a $15 fingerprint fee, $115 on renewal. The state police get somewhere between $74 and $79 of each license. According to their own annual reporting, about 75% of the money they get is profit profit and so what if you do in, if you're in an area where maybe you don't have the money right now to go get the training and then go get the license just so you can lawfully protect yourself while you're walking your dog you risk that felony instead of giving the state the 75 percent profit representative carter you asked the question about liability uh, the answer again is the liability exactly the same it's a matter of proximate cause who caused what happened whether it was a criminal whether it was a carrier that is liable for that action. Um, I'd be happy to give you a more in-depth answer later if you'd like. And lastly, I'd just like to end on what is inherently wrong with concealing a pistol? What is inherently wrong with putting a coat on? And the answer is nothing. I'm, I'm completely fine with punishing people who do bad things with firearms. It is wrong to me to punish an otherwise benign action especially so severely. And again, that is why Michigan Open Carry so strongly supports this legislation. Be very, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your patience and for allowing me to get through all this. Representative Carter does have a question. No, just quickly. And, and I appreciate your demonstration of taking the uh, weapon out and doing all that. I just looked at myself in the mirror and I said, could you imagine me in certain places popping that trunk, pulling that out? How many police do you think would show up in my world? I agree with you, Representative. I completely agree, in, uh, especially in Wayne County and a lot of places where I, I believe I understand where you're going, but I don't even want to go there. Just anyone in those areas. We've had problems uh, of exactly what you're worried about happening. Whether somebody wants to carry open or concealed, I would like them to avoid this process, and I think that's an unintended consequence of this, this law.
Well, there have been a lot of people prosecuted in that area, and I've worked in the courts, the jails, and every place else because of unintended consequences. So when I look at this, I don't look at it as separate communities. We have to remember, we're talking about the entire state, and things will be interpreted differently in different areas. Sure. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions of any other committee members? Thank you. Thank you again for your time. At this time, we have Lee, is it Miracle? Miracle. Mr. Miracle from the Southeast Michigan Volunteer Militia supports the bill, I believe, yes, and wishes two minutes to speak. Dude. My name's Lee Miracle. I'm uh, the coordinator and one of the legislative uh, members of the Southeast Michigan Volunteer Militia. We're trying to get our members more involved in these processes, and I, I thank you for allowing me to speak here. Um, it would be difficult to uh, get from my little speech what hasn't already been covered. Uh, I would like to remind the committee that uh, all of their authority emanates from all of the people and that none of us really has the authority to deny you the right to carry something. And since we don't have that authority, we can't grant it to you. So uh, we're in support of these bills. Uh, we think it's a good start. Uh, I like the idea of constitutional carry. Um, the process he demonstrated, um, I have gone through more times than I'd care to, care to remember. And I believe that um, had I not had to go through that, it would be much safer for me to carry if I could just get in and out of the truck with the uh, pistol on my hip without having to do all this sort of nonsense. So for safety reasons and for just common sense and for constitutional reasons, I, I, can't, see, I can't see this being opposed by anyone other than those who believe that all authority needs to reside in the hands of the state. And we can cry safety, safety all we want to, but really what we're crying is, I'm the boss of you people, and I don't like that. So I would say support these bills as much as possible, and I would also like to mention that in a committee hearing about concealed pistols, it's difficult to see the point in bringing up mass shootings that have occurred with rifles. Uh, this, this is a concealed pistol legislation hearing, so when we say, well, there are mass shootings committed in place X and place Y and place Z, those did not occur with concealed pistols, and that's really not what this is about today. Um, I still support open carry of long guns, but that's not what this is about here. So on that, I appreciate you listening to me and putting up with my nervous self. And um, I hardly support the bill, as does my entire organization, the uh, Southeast Michigan Volunteer Militia. So Thank if you. there's anything... Yeah, Representative Jones, or Vice Chair Jones has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Miracle, uh, thanks for being here. Um, Thank you. I guess Southeast Michigan is in my neck of the woods, so maybe I get a chance to come check you out one of these days. Well, absolutely, we'd love it. Yeah, but, uh, I, you know, you had said, uh, I think, um, I'm, I kind of think about the same thing as you. I think we discuss a lot of things here that are that not necessarily relevant, um, with this being the military and veterans and Homeland Security Committee, of course. Um, I think we need to focus a little bit more on some of our military and veterans as well. So I think, you know, I appreciate this issue coming forward. I miss a, a, a major, uh, overwhelming uh, group of people inside of our state that support this. But I think uh, moving forward, maybe we can have some more conversation around military and veterans as well. So that's, an, you know, another portion of our uh, committee Chair, structure as well. Mr. Vice Chair, you're welcome to sponsor a bill at any time. I, I am also a veteran. Uh, so I'm all about what we can do for the veterans. In fact, it, it, a consideration could be that a DD-214 uh, could act as a de facto CPL uh, because we know our veterans are all well-trained. Uh, in that regard, you might want to consider, someone might consider bringing that up, that uh, a DD-214 could replace the uh, CPL training. And that's something to consider also. A DD-214, for those who don't know, is the military discharge papers. Uh, which I proudly carry. Well, sir, thank you for your service and your testimony. Are there thank any, you. Any further questions? No further questions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. We have um, 
too many cards to read in uh, before we have to go off to uh, session. So the clerk will read those on to the record. Um, actually, you know what? Why don't we just run through them? Members, feel free to take off before I'm done here. But Frank Foster, representing every town for gun safety, opposes the bill, does not wish to testify. San Champagne from Henry Ford Health System opposes the bill, does not wish to testify. Um, Rachel Kelly, Ascension, Michigan, opposes the bill, does not wish to testify. The Mary Pollock, is it? P of the American Association of University Women, opposes the bill, does not wish to speak. Trinity Health opposes the bill, does not wish to speak. McLaren opposes the bill, does not wish to speak. Paul of the Michigan Catholic Conference opposes the bill, does not wish to speak. And... Sean of the Michigan Health and Hospital Association also opposes the bill but does not wish to speak. Any further business of the committee? There being no absent members, we are adjourned.